Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be about the Summerton Man case. So I know I don't normally kind of do mysteries on this channel, but this particular mystery looks like it's just about to be solved using DNA evidence. That's genetic genealogy about to crack this one. So if you don't already know the story of the Summerton Man, buckle in because this is a crazy story. Um, but before I get started, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell because it really helps out my channel when you do. Alright, so at 6.30am on the 1st of December in 1948, the police were contacted after a body was discovered at Somerton Beach that is just outside of Adelaide in South Australia. Um, the body was a male. They decided that he was probably between 40 and 45 years old. He looked like he was in really good health. He was clean shaven. He was wearing nice clothes. Um, and he was sitting with his legs extended and his ankles crossed. So as he was examined, some strange things started to come to light. Firstly, all of his clothing, um, all of the tags had been removed. All of the identifying tags on every single item of clothing that he was wearing had been removed. He was also not wearing a hat and he was not carrying a wallet or any other kind of ID, which was really unusual for 1948. Inside his pants, there was also an extra kind of little secret sewn in pocket in there that had um, a piece of paper that had been torn out from a book and the words on it said, Tamam should. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, sorry if I'm not. Um, but that phrase is apparently like Persian or Arabic or something and it means is over or the end. The page turned out to be from an extremely rare book called the Rubiat. And there were very few copies of this book around, so the police did like a nationwide appeal to try to track down the book that this had been torn out of, because it was basically like one of the only clues that they had. Before I tell you more about the book, I'll just quickly also mention that they did an autopsy to try to determine the cause of death, and they found that he was in very good health. He had some food in his stomach. Like a few hours earlier, he'd eaten a pastry and the he, all of his organs were in like quite good condition and stuff. So the best cause of death that they could determine was poisoning, but they couldn't find any traces of any poison in his system. So I think that they ruled poisoning as the cause, but there was no like conclusive kind of evidence there. He was 180 centimeters tall. He was broad shouldered. He had apparently unusual kind of, uh, his calves were very well defined and his toes were kind of unusual. They said that it was possibly that he either wore like high heeled boots or pointed like boots or shoes often or possibly he was a ballet dancer and his calves and toes had ended up that way from ballet. So that's just a few more unusual things. <laughs> okay, back to the book. So they put out the appeal looking for the copy of this Rubiat unusual book. And there was a guy who had left his car apparently parked and unlocked with the windows down nearby to that Somerton beach. And he had found a copy of the book uh, like the next morning. It had just been tossed in the window of his car. So he gave the book to the police and sure enough, the back page of the book was torn out. So this did belong to the unidentified man. Okay, so some interesting things about this book when they had a look at it. There was a name and a phone number in it. There was also an unidentified number. And there was also an encrypted message in there. So these things had been handwritten into the book, which <laughs> in a very rare book, I feel like, why are you writing in this book? You shouldn't be. Anyway, that aside. So the first, the name and the phone number. So there was a name and a number. It was a woman and she actually lived nearby. So the police went to her house to ask her some questions. She was a nurse. And she claimed that she did not know who the man was. She did not know why her name or phone number was in his book. But she said that she had had a copy of that same book, the Rubiat, and 
she'd sold it or given it to a man, I think his name was Boxall, the previous year. And so the police tried to trace down this Boxall guy and when they did, they found that he still had his intact copy that didn't have any pages ripped out. So that was really weird. It's like two copies of that same rare book, like, hmm. So there's that. Um, one more thing about this nurse lady though, is that when the police, um, they did like a plaster kind of bust of the man, since he was unidentified. And when the woman saw the bust, she said that she didn't know him, but apparently her reaction was quite extreme. She looked like she was going to faint. She got very agitated sort of thing. So they were suspicious that she wasn't really telling the whole truth. She then insisted that they take her name off any of the sort of case files, anything to do with the case. So her name was changed to like a different name. She was I don't know. I don't know why she wanted her name off everything, but there was that too. Um, years later, apparently her daughter was like interviewed about it and her daughter thought that perhaps she'd known something, but they, they never found out. So that's that. She died actually in 2007, so we'll never get the story from her. <laughs> okay, the other number, like I said, was unidentified and the encrypted message. So there was a, it was a few lines and it was clearly a coded message and like expert code breakers have had a look at this and they can't break the code. It is still not being broken, but they can say that it is definitely a code. So I don't know how these people know this, like obviously experts can analyze it somehow. And so they know it's a code, but I think it's because it's only a few lines. It's too hard for them to kind of get any kind of, um, like patterns to be able to decode it. So there's that, a secret code inside the book too. So one more thing I'll just quickly add about this book. This is a little offshoot, but in 1945, so this is three years before, there was a man named George Marshall who was found dead in Sydney, Australia. And his cause of death, he was just found sitting on a bench. His cause of death was found to be poisoning. They, I don't think they identified the poison though, once again. And um, he had an open copy of the Rubiart on his lap when they found him. So I don't know what this means, like whether that's a pattern, whether these are connected. I don't think that they've been proven to be connected, but it seems like a huge coincidence. So since the police couldn't identify the man, they ended up having the body embalmed on the 10th of December, 1948, and he was buried. So he just remained an unsolved case, but that was not the end of the story. So in January the following year, 1949, it was about a year later, um, some employees at an Adelaide railway station came across an unmarked brown suitcase and they uh, tracked it to having been checked in at around 11 a.m on the 30th of November, 1948. So that's just a couple of days before the Somerton man was found dead. So I'm gonna tell you now the contents of the suitcase. A red checked dressing gown, a size seven red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc that was thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush that was used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. There was also in the suitcase a thread card of Barber brand orange waxed thread of an unusual type that was not found in Australia. That same thread was found to have repaired the lining in the pocket of the trousers that the dead man was wearing. Now all of the identifying tags on all of the clothing in the case had been removed, just like the tags on the clothes he was wearing. There was just, um, I think three, not tags, but a tie had a name on it and so did a laundry bag and some dry cleaning. So they said T Keen. Um, however, the police have been suspicious that that name is actually kind of a red herring. 
they tried to track it down there was no tea keen missing in australia or even in like other parts of the world that they'd searched so they actually thought that considering the names had been removed from all the other clothing that the tea keen had been left there almost to throw people off the scent so the train records show that the man had arrived from either sydney melbourne or port augusta they weren't sure which and he had then gone and purchased a ticket for the 1050 train to Henley Beach. Um, this ticket was in his pocket when he was found dead and he had not used it yet because it was, it hadn't got to that time yet. An inquest showed that the man's shoes were really um, in great condition and they looked like they'd just been recently polished, which, um, wasn't consistent with somebody who'd been like walking around for the day or anything and so it made them suspicious that the body had actually been moved to that place in the beach which would also fit with if he was poisoned there was no sort of evidence of vomiting or um anything like that that would have happened like convulsions that like he was very neat and put together Okay, so that kind of gets you up to speed with the basics of the case. If you're interested though, it's there's a lot more that you can read about, so I encourage you to go and look it up if you're interested. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. I, it's hard to believe that the guy hasn't been identified, but considering all the odd things, like his clothing tags being removed, the code in his book and, and stuff like that, people have thrown around theories like that he was some kind of spy or... Um, maybe a jilted lover was one of the other kind of possibilities that's been thrown around, but we will soon see because a couple of weeks ago, his remains were exhumed from the cemetery and they are going to take a DNA sample and do a DNA analysis. And considering nowadays how many, um, people are using genetic genealogy, we have a huge pool of people that he could match with. So it'll be really interesting to see if the people on the case can now figure out who he is. So if you've never heard of this case before, now you have, and now you can be just as excited as me to finally figure out who maybe this guy is. And it might bring closure to his family. There've been so many cold cases now that have been solved by genetic genealogy that, yeah, we're really sort of at the forefront of this technology and we're maybe about to solve another mystery. All right, I think that is about it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it and please chat with me in the comments about this one. What do you think? Who was this guy? Are you excited about these results like I am? <laughs> if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and I will see you soon in my next video. Bye guys.